My name is Betty Grit, and I am the manager of the Worship Renewal Grants Program here at the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship. Each year through generous funding from Lilly Endowment, we are able to award 40 to 60 grants for a year-long process of worship renewal to churches, <coughs> schools, seminaries, colleges. Through those grants, we not only help those congregations on their own worship renewal, but we also learn from them. They provide a wonderful window of learning. It's always a joy to see the fruit that grows when learning is focused on worship renewal. Some churches report the process results in increased giving or even numerical growth. But often it is a deeper engagement, understanding of worship. Each year we send emails to all past grant, re grant recipients. We've been giving them, them since the year 2000, so it's 600 about now. And we ask them, what have you learned about worship renewal since the past <coughs> year? That learning is always encouraging and gives us great insight to the lasting power of a year of worship <coughs> renewal. Last year, and again this year, funding priority is for grants that are either international or intergenerational or focused on the Psalms. Vertical habits, that term, uh, has been a framework for many projects that wanted to engage the congregation in learning about why we do what we do in worship. When we pray, sing, read the Psalms, we are learning language to express a wide range of emotions to God in worship and in our lives. This term, vertical habits, was first used by a church, a church plant in Edmonton. They thought about this framework of the emotions, expressing them to God and to one another, and they thought, I wonder if this would work in our church plant people who have no history of faith, of Christianity, would it help them understand what they do in worship? They tried it for a year and they said, this is amazing. This has really made a difference for us. So here at the Worship Institute, we wondered, <coughs> so would this help churches who have people who have been lifelong believers, people uh, in a school, would this work? So we invited 23 congregations to partner with us. We came in, we learned for three days about the vertical habits. We said, go home and try this and let us know. The only thing we ask of you is that all the resources that you create, you share with us so we can share them with other congregations. So on this new vertical habits resource showcase, you'll find many of the resources created by those churches. Since that time, many, many churches have explored vertical habits and have found it to be helpful. So today, I have invited four grant recipients who spend time in the vertical habits to share their stories, their experiences with you. So if each of you will introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about the context of where you do ministry and a little bit about your project. My name is Mike Cosper. I'm the pastor of Worship and Arts at Sojourn Community Church in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Sojourn's a church that was planted about uh, 11 years ago now, uh, kind of in Louisville's urban core. And uh, over the years, we we moved from the Highlands, which is one neighborhood over to a neighborhood called Germantown. Um, the church is a is a pretty diverse community in terms of at least in terms of socioeconomic diversity. You have the Germantown neighborhood is um, you know. Uh, lower middle class and and you know in true poverty uh, blue collar living right next door to upper middle class uh, progressives who've moved into the city bought homes renovated uh, and are part of sort of urban revitalization so the church is right in the middle of this neighborhood and is reaching and connecting with with both of those communities um, uh, should I go ahead and talk about the project a little bit? Sure. What we did? Okay. So what we did, um, we, we did a vertical habits grant, I think in 2005 or 2006. And uh, our, our goal with the, with the project was to sort of revisit, um, the connect the language of the vertical habits with the, the language of, of liturgy, the language of worship. 
how do our people understand what they do when they when they come into our services and, and participate? Um, I've given our di the dynamics of our church. You've got people with you know Berkeley educations living next door to people with with you know with no educations at all. Uh, how do these how do these how does this community come together and, and worship together in a way that, that everyone understands what's going on and that's engaging and, and challenging to both? And what was encouraging for us, and the reason, one of the reasons I love the, the vertical habits concept, is because it's disarming to both sides. Um, for 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 Christians and for people who are familiar with sort of Christian language, they step into uh, a worship service and they hear the the familiar terms of, you know, now is the time for our prayer of confession and our words of assurance and. Now is the time for our song of adoration, or whatever, whatever the you know whatever the sort of familiar language is. They hear that language, and it, it becomes something that you sort of lose. It loses vitality by repetition. You hear it over and over again, and it's easy to sort of shelve that off and corner that off into a piece of your life because you don't talk like that outside of your church services. That's not the the ordinary way that we communicate with one another. So what's great about the vertical habits is it sort of disarms that in Christians. It, it subverts it and, and forces people to sort of encounter those experiences of worship in a new way with fresh language. And with the vertical habits in particular, it's very emotional, personal, intimate kind of language. The flip side of that is that people who are outsiders, who aren't sort of versed in the language, um, when, when, they hear, when they hear, for lack of a better term, when they hear sort of the Christianese of worship, uh, they feel like an outsider. It, it is unfamiliar to them, and they're thinking to themselves, I, this doesn't have anything to do with me. I, I don't know what this is. I don't belong here. I don't have a place. The, so so by, by integrating vertical habits language um, and, and sort of reframing the way we think about it, it allows us to speak in a way that's common and ordinary, and, and people who are outsiders can connect with it uh, because it's the way that they talk about relationships in their homes and their families. So we did a variety of things. We, we spent some time, we started by, by, we sort of rooted them in the Psalms and, and rooted it in the concept of, of psalmic, emotional, personal, responsive worship. Uh, so we did a, a sermon series on the Psalms and we followed that up with, with uh, a variety of workshops on the Psalms and connecting them to, connecting the language of, of worship to the language of the Psalms. And, and then we just sort of left the project in the hands of a number of creative teams in our church, some songwriters. <laughs> Uh, sort of latched onto the ideas and began writing songs, trying to trying to sort of simply and clearly articulate these these various elements of worship: uh, "I love you," "I'm sorry," uh, "Why God," that sort of thing. Um, and then similarly, we had a, a group of visual artists who did the project as well, and their project was very interesting in that initially they were each there were about five or six of them. They were each going to take a couple of the, the the habits that you see there and and work on pieces. But as more people got involved, they wanted to sort of incorporate it with everyone. And so what ended up happening is they're, they're sort of, they, they all collaborated on each of these pieces. So one person might do some photography, one person might do some drawing, one, one person might do some, um, um, some painting, but all on the same pieces. So you had this, these sort of fantastically multi-layered uh, uh, art pieces that each communicated um, a, a, a vertical habit and connected it to a movement of the liturgy. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, but that was, that was kind of our project. My name is Bruce Benedict, and currently I'm the Worship and Community Life Director at Christ the King Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, when, so I was, I was at a church in Indianapolis when I um, was a part of a, a grant for the Vertical Habits. And we had a, had a worship renewal grant in maybe 2005 uh, that was focused around engaging uh, children in worship. And we had a number of, uh, of artists create, um, work with the kids in creating different sorts of art for uh, different liturgical seasons. Um, and I think out of that, we got invited to participate uh, as, as, as a kind of as a resource uh, specialist for the Vertical Habits. Um, and so we went through a process of learning about what these things are, what these simple tools are, um, that are basic building blocks of communication um, that help us to understand what's going on in worship. What's a way to communicate uh, the call to worship? Kind of some of the liturgical kind of worship terms we use. What are some of the ways we can communicate that? 
Um, and for us, it was really in the context of how can we teach uh, children? I and mean, we had um, a situation where we had 60 or 70 kids under the age of, of 10 or 11. So we had a couple of artists create both really simple icons. And we live in a, a very visual world, uh, and we um, we understand what you know visual media um, communicates. So we created some simple icons um, that were a part of a guide that we gave to parents to help them explain uh, our, our worship service. Um, and those have been have been picked up and used in a number of different places. So that's been really exciting. And then we also created. Um, paintings that went along with each vertical habit, and then we used those in our worship service um, through over a period of maybe six months. We would have we would have a painting up to talk about it in the context of teaching um, the kids about the different movements in our worship service. My name is Laura Keeley, and I'm the Director of Children's Ministries at 14th Street Christian Reformed Church in Holland, Michigan. Holland, for those of you who don't know, is about 45 minutes that way, and we are closer to the lake. Um, our congregation is about, I think, 108 years old. Oh, maybe 110. Um, we uh, have about 225 people worshiping on a Sunday, so not a very large church, medium size. Um, we had our worship renewal grant last year and completed it this June. And we looked at three things. Um, we started by looking at visual arts, which we really wanted to get to, and then we decided to add vertical habits. And because, since we were a church, we figured we should add psalms. Um, what we found was that the visual arts and the vertical habits both informed our study of the psalms so that our congregation had ways to access the Psalms that we didn't have before. And because the vertical habits are written so simply, all ages could have access to the information we want to learning about the Psalms and learning about our order of worship. We had a series of speakers come in who talked about Psalms. We did some intergenerational um, events. Our um, Third, we had our evening worship services, always were focused on a psalm, and the, the vertical habits um, provided a structure for our grant, so that each month we were looking at a different vertical habit along with a different psalm. So it kind of framed us and gave us access to the psalms. What I liked particularly about vertical habits is that for children, as was mentioned earlier, children can get it, but it's also with the psalms, it's kind of equal access. The adults don't know the Psalms that well either. So we were all approaching the Psalms with a fresh look and with some words that we could grab onto as well as use as an evaluative tool as we're reading the Psalms. Well, does this Psalm talk about why or is this Psalm talking about I'm sorry? So it, it really helped um, and create, energize what we were doing and shape it. Hi, uh, my name is Young Kim, and I'm actually uh, currently a professor here at Calvin in history. Um, but when I was a graduate student, um, I was the project coordinator for a worship renewal grant, and this was when I was living in Ann Arbor at uh, Cornerstone Christian Reformed Church. Um, just to give you a little, a little bit of context about our church community, when we had uh, received, or when we had sort of um, received overtures from the Calvin Institute for our uh, pursuing a grant. We were a relatively young church. Uh, it was actually a result of a merger of two different congregations. And uh, when we found out about this grant and we came to Grand Rapids to learn more about vertical habits, um, I think admittedly uh, it was a bit confusing for us uh, because there were several concepts that were uh, really unfamiliar to us. We didn't really know uh, or had never thought about uh, worship renewal as a concept. Uh, and then also, of course, these vertical habits, while in, sort of in, as we think about them, are really sort of, um, well, duh, in, in some sense. Uh, these are things that we do every day. But when, we, when it was introduced to us, we actually didn't know quite what it meant. And so um, as we got together in Ann Arbor, uh, one of the things that we, we latched onto were 
uh, was, the, was the fact that we were in this um, very uh, university-centered community. Uh, Ann Arbor is where the University of Michigan is located. And so as we thought about worship, and we thought about renewal, and then we tried to <laughs> bring in this concept of vertical habits to what we were doing, uh, we, we, we sort of identified a couple areas where we wanted to apply this grant. Number one was the idea of worship. Um, and we really realized that for many of our congregants, worship was almost exclusively something that we did on Sunday. Uh, you know, we come to church, uh, we participate in the different uh, parts of the worship service, and then uh, we would leave church. And uh, we realized that if we want to think about worship renewal, uh, we wanted that to carry over into, uh, into the other days of the week. And so that's really where the concept of vertical habits made a lot of sense because uh, the word habit um, it really implies it's something that we do uh, regularly, often. Uh, and so we thought about, well, uh, instead of thinking about vertical habits, what are just our normal habits for the, the members of our congregation? And again, uh, one of the things that we realized being in a place like Ann Arbor is that um, with a lot of students, graduate students, young, um, young professionals, everyone was in some form or fashion connected to the internet. Uh, and really as a daily habit, we realized that we would wake up, um, do our normal morning routine, run 10 miles and pray for three hours, that kind of thing. But then pretty soon thereafter, uh, we would uh, turn on our computers and we would check our email. Um, and this is really interesting because we received the grant in 2006, and so this is, um, as I was describing yesterday at our seminar, kind of at the cusp of the Facebook revolution. Uh, people actually weren't um, really all in for Facebook at the time, but actually a lot of our congregants were using a different platform, a blog platform. And so people were, uh, we realized every day, uh, checking their email and um, updating their blogs. Uh, and so what we wanted to do then was, uh, how we wanted to ask ourselves, we asked ourselves, how could we take worship, something that we do typically on a Sunday, and then take this habit that we have of, of, of going virtual every day and somehow bring them together. And so then our project uh, sort of looked like this. We had an eight-week series. We took each of these individual vertical habits. And in the eight weeks leading up to uh, Easter, uh, we would begin each Sunday with a sermon series, uh, I mean, a sermon by our pastor relating to that particular vertical habit. Uh, we had artwork and music that were integrated into the worship service that reflected that particular vertical habit. And then the children's ministry were all, was also involved in uh, learning about that particular ver vertical habit. But really, um, in my own mind, um, the, the piece of our grant that was really interesting was uh, we started an online <coughs> devotional blog. Uh, and so what I did as the director was, for those eight weeks, um, I invited and asked and sort of um, had to beg and plead um, for contributors to write a, a devotional entry. Uh, and so what was really interesting is for the course of uh, those eight weeks, um, for each day that we had this blog, uh, we had unique contributions from everyone. Uh, and what was, again, even more interesting was that uh, we had contributions of uh, a wide variety. Uh, we had people writing poems people writing prayers, letters to God. We had a student who thought that it'd be clever to write several haiku. Um, and then we had our children. Um, one of the things that they did, you can see it on our poster, is um, during their Sunday school, they, um, they drew and they did art um, that in some way reflected that particular vertical habit. And so as one of the devotional entries for the week, I would post uh, the, the artwork of our, of our children. And so uh, it ended up being a really interesting uh, project because what I would do is the night before, um, you know, two or three in the morning, I would um, post the next day's <coughs> entry with the idea then that whenever our congregants woke up the next morning and, 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 and connected to the internet, that here they would, uh, one of the first things that they would see would be this blog entry about the vertical habit for the week written by one of the members of our congregation. Uh, and so really that was a way then to take our Sunday worship practices and extend it uh, through the week and really to kind of reinforce and, and enrich the, the concepts that we're learning about the time. So, that's all for that. Thanks to each of you. You've, you have just had a little
glimpse into the projects that they've had. But Young mentioned, uh, you know, this was all a little confusing, and I wonder if we should take just a minute to go to our handout and just go over these vertical habits um, and fill in the blanks. So we learn to say to one another, we teach our children this, we learn to say to God, I love you. Uh, and with each of these, we've listed just one model psalm that, that does that. Uh, but in our worship language, when we say to God, I love you, what word do we use? Praise. We teach children, and we want adults to know how to say, I'm sorry. When we say to God, I'm sorry, what's the word that we use? Confession. Confession. We don't have to really teach our two-year-olds to say why, right? <laughs> why is the sky blue, and why is the snow white, and why is... Uh, that one comes fairly naturally, but we find that we also ask God why, don't we? And what word do we use for that? Lament. Lament. And I'm guessing all of you have been in numerous sessions already, this symposium, um, thinking about lament. We want children to learn to say, I'm listening. How many mothers haven't said, are you listening? Did you hear me? We, when we say to God, I'm listening, what is the word that we use? Illumination. Years ago, before the sermon, there was always the prayer of illumination. I don't think that term is used so much anymore. When we ask God for help, what word do we use? Petition. Petition. When we say thank you to God, what word do we use? Thanksgiving, or gratitude. gratitude. When we ask God, what can I do, what word do we use? Offering, sure. Offering or service. Sending. And bless you would become in... All right, or blessing, sending. So now I'm going to ask our panelists, and I will give all of you an opportunity to ask them questions too. In this process, this vertical habits process, in each of your contexts, what surprised you? Can you go first, Mike? I think um, providentially, our project came at a really, uh, a really intense season of ministry. We were. Um, uh, we had just bought a building, we were in the midst of renovations. Um, uh, I'm the worship pastor, uh, but uh, in a church with three staff, uh, a lead pastor, a worship pastor, and, 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 a, and essentially a, a bookkeeper, uh, somebody had to run the building campaign and, and all of that. So in the midst of all of that, I was running a capital campaign, we were working on this, this vertical habits thing. And so I, I had to kind of pull my hands off of it a lot earlier than I, my instincts would have told me to do so. I would, have, I would have stayed far more involved, far more, probably far more controlling of how the process unfolded and developed. I just didn't have the energy to do it. Um, and I think that, was, that ended up making it a better project um, because what it, what it forced me to do was to, to teach people some things, um, do a little bit of training and, and thinking with a group and then take my hands off of it and let them just run with it. And it was an amazing kind of surprise, you know, maybe three months after we had done the project, uh, when we had done all the, the workshops and everything, to, to start getting emails from people saying, hey, here's a song, um, you know, to get updates from the visual arts ministry. We had a, a guy who was a, a volunteer who was running that, that ministry at the time, uh, who started sending me like, you know, little digital photos of, of the work as it was progressing. and uh, It was just amazing to see that people really, people really connected to the concept and wanted to do something with it. So I think that was probably the biggest surprise was just that I didn't have to do anything uh, beyond, you know, uh, sort of challenging people to step into it. <clears throat> I think the most surprising thing for me was I was working on the, 
we, we, we did some part of it with music, some part of it with paintings, and then we did some part of it with creating these visual icons. And I think the most interesting, surprising part to me was working with a good friend of mine who was sort of a reluctant churchgoer at the time. He was a really fantastic graphic designer. And, and I thought that this would be a great opportunity to just hang out with him and to have conversations around a place that he was, he was comfortable doing work. Um, and because the nature of the vertical habits, it's very simple communication, it's very much uh, intriguing to a graphic designer who's interested in how do you take basic communication concepts and translate it into visual uh, communication. So he uh, created these so that, you know, if you see the icons and there's, there's links on, um, on Calvin's worship website, they're quite small. But initially they started out as these really large hand-drawn um, pictures. Uh, and he would, he'd create one and then he would show it to me. And then so we had to have all these conversations about, well, how is this communicating the idea behind the vertical habit? How, you know, him trying to think about how is this going to help uh, kids in our church worship, which is not something that he had ever thought about in the context of doing graphic design work. So I think the most surprising thing was how uh, we both just really grew in thinking about worship, and, and really um, we were both just really stretched outside of our, our normal ways of kind of the ruts that you exist in, in terms of whatever you know the work is that you do. I think the thing that, there are a couple of things that surprised us. Um, one of them was how the people we were able to reach. Um, I'm thinking of a third grade little boy at our church who, um, the best way to describe him, he is squirrely and runs around and hard to keep his attention. All the wonderful things of a third grade little boy. But um, one week before church, in their children worship room, at they were studying the vertical habits, and he was sitting before church underlining in his Bible verses that would fit, that he could use to put in his vertical habits notebook that he was making in children of worship. So it was reaching him, which I never would have expected. On the other hand of the spectrum, we also had a, a mother who was part of our team um, with young children who found out she had breast cancer towards the end of our grant and um, was very sad facing aggressive therapy and chemo and radiation. Um, and she wrote me, well, we had learned how to lament. And she wrote me that their family was living in Psalm 91, which talks about how the angels, um, the angels are concerning you to guard you, and they will lift you up in their hands. And I thought of her family and the fact that Psalm 91 was suddenly speaking to them, and I don't know if they would have had access to that song before. Um, for our ending service, um, at this time our hair is starting to fall out, our, yes, we at the end of our grant, and the kids, we, you know, we had them sing, we had them sing a song by John Bell called Don't Be Afraid interspersed with readings of Psalm 46. Two of the kids up there singing were her own children. Singing, don't be afraid. Our God is stronger. Our God is stronger than your fears. And it was like our whole congregation could express those feelings because we'd seen it in the Psalms, because we'd learned some of the simple words from vertical habits. It was all right for us together to lament and say, why is this happening? There were uh, just a lot of things that were really remarkable about this grant, but I'll just highlight a couple. Uh, one of the things that um, I think is really was really clear to us is that um, all of these vertical habits are um, they're just a part of the life of church and community. Um, and it wasn't that one week everyone was going through a period of lament, and another week everyone was expressing gratitude. I mean, all of these habits and all of these expressions are just um, each and every day and each and every Sunday are part of our church community. Uh, and so uh, one of the real profound observations that we had was in particular with the, uh, the habit of lament. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, we found that uh, just even just the word why is, um, it doesn't matter 
uh, how old a person is. Um, that just sort of basic um, uh, human question resonates with, uh, with everyone and, and, and of whatever age. And so uh, we had uh, one of our um, Sunday school children. Uh, her family was, uh, she was adopted, and her family was going through the process of adopting another daughter. And for her, that, um, that longing, that anticipation, the confusion as to why it took so long uh, was for her a lament. And so she drew this picture of her family with sad faces and then an airplane. And she wrote in her own hand this question, why does it take so long to get a sister? And so for people who saw that, it's just really, um, even though this is a, a four-year-old girl, what a profound expression of, of lament. Uh, but another example is there was a, um, one of the sisters in our church, she was a college student, probably about two, I think, or three months before our grant began, um, her mother passed away after a long bout of, of illness. And she volunteered to write one of our blog entries, in particular for the Week of Lament. And so as our church um, knew and understood the things that she was going through, the emotions that she had, and and, and, the, and the challenges that she was facing, she wrote this prayer to God of lament. And it was, again, um, just in a different way, completely and totally uh, profound. Uh, because here are the rawest of emotions coming from one of our congregants. And yet, this was a, uh, a means for not only her to lament, but for our entire congreg congregation to lament with her. And so that was really remarkable about these vertical habits, that these are things that um, we all experience at one point or another, and we all express it at different times. Thanks to each of you. I think what has been so surprising to us is the, the life of vertical habits that just keeps going. Uh, so it started with this grant recipient in 2005, and churches just keep taking it, using it, doing it in different ways. Uh, Bruce mentioned the icons that his friend made. Um, Chris Moore from Cincinnati Children's Hospital designed them uh, and made t-shirts which the kids in their residential setting and their staff wear regularly and uh, they can explain what that all means. Right now uh, we have five churches I think uh, working in the vertical habits, one in Pella, Iowa, one in uh, California, several here in Michigan, and so it seems like it, it just has a, a life of its own and it's really a growing project. We ask that anybody who tries Vertical <coughs> Habits that you send us your resources um, so that they can be used by other churches as they use this framework. So what questions did you bring today? kind of a nitty-gritty question um, on imagining kind of ways in which a grant would play in our community and how we would imagine bringing something to fruition, but how did you guys um, approach administering the grant? What ways was it most beneficial as far as the actual grant dollars? Where did that, where did that have the most impact for you in, in enabling some new projects you might not have been able to do before? Um, how did that work? Maybe I should answer first, in that the, um, those who were invited into the Vertical Habits Project, it was structured a little bit different about how money could be used. It was a very small grant, very frankly. We didn't <laughs> give them a whole lot. They gave us a whole lot. So with the $35 gift card. <laughs> <laughs> Just about. Um, and what they could do with that money was different than in our the broader, uh, program. broader uh, program. So basically, to answer, um, Grant money can be used for new learning, some speakers to come in, some uh, book studies, and I think a lot of you did that kind of thing, um, to uh, buy some materials for creating art. Um, I always kind of laugh when some of these people say we commissioned, because I think a lot of people think commission, <laughs> big dollars, commission, <laughs> think the $35 <laughs> So just, you know, to kind of keep this, um, but the, the grants are around $10,000, depending on the budget that's proposed, and um, we think food is a good use of grant money, 
because it brings people together when it's you're talking around a meal. I mean, we've heard several stories here of meals. Um, and sometimes, especially in churches that are used to doing potlucks and everybody has to bring their whatever, uh, to have some grand money that they can just come and enjoy the food or breakfast or meal, we think that's a good use because it frees up people to converse and learn and let that learning go deep. Did anybody want to add to that? Just kind of different, different, uh, we're talking about two different kinds of programs here. I had a question in the back. Yeah, I was just wondering, just being a person who came to this not knowing anything about vertical habits or worship renewal grant, if you could just kind of give an overview of what is this whole thing about and how it got started and all that. Sure, that would be, be happy to do it in just two minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can be started talking about this program. It is so <laughs> exciting because, uh, again, through the generous funding of Lilly Endowment, we are able to award these grants. Uh, proposals come in in January, January 10 of every year is the postmark deadline, so the new proposals have just arrived. Uh, we have a grants advisory board that reads every proposal, makes a decision of which will be funded. Um, has to be focused on corporate worship. So worship also means all of life um, service, and we get some proposals about that. and. The board doesn't fund those. What happens, we have learned, and it's been reinforced, that when you focus for a year on renewal within your worship service, the time when the congregation gathers, the ripple effect from that is quite amazing. And so people end up giving more and um, serving more. I was in a church um, in Seattle this fall that had received a grant a couple of years ago. And theirs were for visuals too, Laurel, you know, like this story. Uh, they, they have a very uh, austere worship space and they wanted to redesign it. And uh, when I, when I uh, was there, they said, uh, that still hasn't happened and suddenly that is not as important. So they had studied space and beauty and worship. So instead they've got this team going to Kenya and they're building a school and they're feeding the homeless in their church, and somehow this focus on worship renewal leads a church to give itself away. And if you look at what is worship renewal, it, it happens, and we hear that over and over and over. Um, does that answer your question? I could go on and on. Yeah. Yes? You were saying that there were two different programs that the folks who were speaking up here, they didn't receive a worship grant? Um, Right now, we only have the Worship Renewal Grant Program that I had talked about. When um, the Edmonton Church um, came back to us to tell us what they had learned from what they called vertical habits, we created a very special one-year-only program by invitation, and we said, help us figure this out. So, Cornerstone, would this work in your church? You're a unique setting. Sojourn, you're just getting started. What would this do for you? Bruce, you've got some creative people. Help us with this. So we invited 23 to come in with us. And um, so that it's, it's a program that's no longer in existence. It was a one-time only thing. But what has happened then from those churches and what they taught us, other churches through the regular grant program have continued to use this framework and many churches are using it and schools that don't get a grant. I mean it really doesn't cost any money to do these kinds of things. It just needs the focus, the purpose uh, and, and organizing. So a, church, or a school, a Christian school here in this area uh, spent a year basically in vertical habits. Um, I think they may have called it created to worship. They didn't have a grant. But they sent us their resources and what they had learned. Um, and we've had quite a few experiences like that. It really doesn't take a grant. So in other words, some now you still have people applying for grants with their main focus being ver vertical habits. Some have, yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. But n by no means is the grant program limited to that. The, it's very diverse. Uh, all the information about the grants program is, is online. The purpose of this 
panel is really to focus on those vertical habits because it can be done anywhere. We've had Christian schools do it. A, church, a school in um, Sunnyside, Washington partnered with all their supporting churches. And so for a whole year, each month, all the churches, uh, well, not all of them, they invited all of them. It turned out that only five agreed to partner with them, but through that year then for one month, they all had a newsletter and uh, scripture, daily scripture readings on I love you or thank you or lament. Um, and the, the principal told me it was so interesting. They had a um, breakfast for everybody and invited all these pastors and only five uh, entered into it with them. I think they have like 35 supporting churches. But as they went through the year and other churches saw what was happening, um, they would come to them and say, so what's the theme going to be next year and can we, can we join in next year? Um, I don't know how many of you are connected with Christian schools, but it was really interesting to me last fall. I met a man who came up to me and said, um, I just brought my daughter to teach at that school. And it was the connection of home, school, and church that had been established through the grant year that drew her to, uh, to teach there, even though she had several job offers. So that's kind of an aside, but an idea, another idea of how the vertical habits have been used. Yes? Speaking of schools, All right. I'm here with a direct focus on teenagers because I teach at a high school and uh, coordinate the chapel program. So I'm wondering if there's anything that you guys did in your churches to kind of specifically hook teenagers. How did you do it and could it be applied in a school setting? Well, I would say, um, you know, social media is... Um, you know, we're we're kind of in that period in, in our in our society and our culture where we're still trying to figure out, you know, what is all of this social media's broad and long term impact, and so I think one of the things that you might think about and what you could do is well, um, let's take this phenomenon and this um, technological events and and harness it um, at least in part uh, to direct um, our, our to direct us. Uh, to God. Uh, and so that was kind of our thinking with this blog was here is something that we do every day um, and certainly we're going to go look and read news sites or we're going to read sports sites and whatever it is that interests us. But what if even just for five to ten minutes we can take some of our patterns of internet surfing and use it um, to to worship uh, in our in our own way. And so um, for teenagers, of course, I mean, this is, the, this is the Twitter and Facebook generation. So I don't know what you could do in 140 characters. You might be able to do some really effective things. But I think um, exploring that is, is worthwhile territory. And rather than running away from it and fearing it and saying, you know, maybe we shouldn't have anything to do with it, let's, let's see what we can do um, and how we can use it. I'm just to speak from our grant. You know, we, um, our congregation, we don't have a lot of teenagers in the church. It's like 20 and over and 10 and under. <laughs> um, but I think from, from the experience that we had, the thing that I would just encourage is making a lot of space for them to, for their own creativity, for their own initiatives. Um, uh, again, just kind of what I mentioned earlier with us, uh, the, the benefit that I, I the big lesson that I took away from it was that how much better it was for me just to to try to to try to focus on sort of inspiring, giving guardrails, and then letting letting their creativity kind of run with things. Or will you tell the story of the high school teacher in your church? Oh, um, our high school um, music teacher is belongs to our church, and you would think he'd be very involved in the chapel program and all this, but he isn't. Um, but the, he, after a year of study, as it progressed, he couldn't help himself. He'd been avoiding doing chapel. He felt the Lord put it on his heart, and he had to start talking about vertical habits and the Psalms to his students. And I heard about it because his students were telling their parents, and the parents came back and told me about what his presentation was about. So I knew it had to be pretty good if it was going through all those different avenues before it came back 
that what we were doing in our church was starting to hit the school and a broader group. That was kind of cool to think that what we did in a small church was really impacting a much larger place. I happened to know him, and he said to me, I found language in the Psalms that I wish I had had when I was a high school student, and I had to tell my students. Yes? I understand that the grant was a finite t a, a certain time. So since then, or 2005, whenever, where we are now, once that project ended, what are some of the the areas of growth or how things changed since that ended. I mean, there was great change, obviously, during the project, but since that project, what is, where have you seen the change or growth? Or? I think uh, for me, just being a part of a process of developing, um, sometimes uh, being given confines for, um, and parameters for a creative project is one of the best gifts you can be given. And this was such a great project because there was very specific ideas, um, there were specific outcomes. And I think for me, I learned a lot of skills in terms of how to do creative projects in the church, in a kind of church context. So that's something that I've really, um, I've really taken with me. I think another thing too, a lot of the resources that we created for the vertical habits are very basic ideas um, for for worship, praise, confession, lament, and I've continued to go back and use them because they were really good materials. Uh, and I've continued to tweak um, and and just to be like, oh, you know what we're doing? Um, we're, you know, there's a real emphasis in confession during Lent. You know, we actually we wrote a song for confession. I don't think we ever even used it, but it was, it was okay. You know, so I you know, sort of planted a lot of seeds uh, that I think um, that, that I've, you know, I've sort of reaped the rewards of that. Want to mention your website where they will find a lot of those resources? You know, on Cardiphonia. Yeah. Um, I have a, a little web page called Cardiphonia, which means uh, kind of the language of the heart or the sounds of the heart. And there's a page, a little page for arts on there, and you can find a lot of the, um, the paintings and the icons and the music, and there it's all available for free. Can you spell that? C A R D I, like heart, party, and then P H O N I A dot org. And I know they're on the um, Calvin site as well. I was going to say, he says it's a little website. It's kind of an encyclopedia. It's a really great resource. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, I think for us, the big takeaway is pretty was just the attention to language, the attention to detail with language. Um, we, you know, being young, uh, such a young church, it was maybe about a year in the, the life of the church that we made the decision to basically script our whole services just because. You, you just don't necessarily always trust a 19-year-old with a guitar behind a microphone to just <laughs> speak off the cuff. Um, so, so it's been that's been part of the life of the church for a long time. But after the project, it, it the attention to detail with regard to making things very clear, very inviting. You know, I think I think one of the big wins as well. This is this is something that anybody can say. These are familiar, you know, relational dynamics. To being, to being able to say, I'm sorry. I'm listening, you know, all of this. So just coming back to that, um, when we talk about, when we, when we write prayers, when we write, you know, if we're, if we're working with litanies, we're just always combing through them and trying to go, how can we make this, how can we make this comprehensible? Not simple, not simplistic, not reductionistic, but just comprehensible and engaging on a, on, on a heart level. And lest any of you teenagers think he was talking about somebody else as that 19-year-old with a guitar that he didn't trust. <laughs> Sorry about it. <laughs> Will you mention your CD, too? Yeah, sure. Um, Sorry. Well, you know what? I'll actually I'll help with that. All right. Thank you. Um, I didn't plan this, but actually the song that Sojourn wrote for the, um, the Virgil Habit, I'm Listening, is a, is a really good song. And we're actually using that song right now. It just happens to be. Thanks. Thank so. you. Yeah, so we, the CD, um, the, there was a CD project that, that was sort of birthed out of this. We've been, the church has been kind of making records since about a year in, uh, which is another long story. But we, um, as a result of this project, you know, the, the songs that came out of the project, the songs that came out of the workshops and everything were, were just really good. They were kind of coherent with each other in terms of the, these ideas. And so we made this record. Um, called Before the Throne. It's it's all original songs except for we did Stephen Vicky Cook's Before the Throne because it 
their their arrangement, or I guess it's just Vicky Cook's arrangement of before uh, before the throne of God above, because it was a just this concept that that all of these things that we say when we gather in the church, we're standing before God's throne, and we have this opportunity for a conversation with Him, where He reveals Himself, and we respond with adoration, confession, all these things. Um, so yeah, if you ever want to check that out, just go to SojourMusic.com, um, and uh, that's up there as well as some other stuff. Now I'm really going to put you on the spot. <laughs> like, so we've talked about the church plant. You be began, you were 19. Um, how many people worship at Sojourn now? We've, um, so we, we are, we're a multi-campus church now. So there's four campuses around, around the city. Uh, big one, main campus is at the heart of the city, and then there's three campuses kind of in the, the ring around the city. Uh, there's about 3,300, 3,400 people gathering uh, on a given weekend. One of the things that our church learned is um, we don't have any records or CDs. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'll have to talk to my husband about that. <laughs> um, the the vertical habits are so relational in their words that I th what happened in our church is we did a couple of intergenerational events, and I think our church, in by having those mixed age groups, became more relational and more willing to share our relationships with not just our peers, but with our children or with our grandparents, where we knew each other better so that we could express some of these feelings that we had better, as well as knowing just by knowing each other and by having the vocabulary to do so. Other questions? Our time is running short. Yes? You mentioned with the other grants that the preference um, had been given the last few years to intergenerational and to song projects. Is that focus going to stay the same when we head for the next few years? I can't really say that for sure. Um, our grants advisory board will be meeting in March. Uh, we'll be choosing the, the grants, and I'm guessing then uh, those decisions will be made and that all becomes available on our website. There is a current grant guidebook if you need want more information on, on the grants. I'd suggest you print that out because all the, the rules and guidelines and timelines and the proposal and everything, uh, that book really is obsolete right now because we uh, update it every year after the grants uh, board meet. So the guidelines basically won't change, but they might they might say, let's reword this question about worship, or let's change the order of the questions. Um, last year they said, um, we tried a, a budget that helped us so much that uh, last year it was a suggested budget format. They said, let's make it required. So I don't know what they will decide, uh, but part of the questions will be related to what a priority might be. Um, the Psalms and intergenerational worship are so embedded uh, at the foundation of the work here at the Worship Institute that I would not be surprised if that be the case again. Yes? Um, I'm curious about um, how you got congregational or church board buy-in. Um, who initiated, hey, we could get a grant, and how did you get people behind? before it got to the congregational level, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like practicing of it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, for, for us, I mean, uh, for us it was very, um, again, being just a young church, we kind of don't have committees or systems that stand in the way of that. It's, it's, it's sort of, you know, one pastor looking at another going, hey, should we do this? Sure, yeah. let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, don't, I don't have any good counsel. <laughs> Let's hear the Presbyterian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the, the best thing you can do is find a church that's similar to yours that did a grant. Um, I so the current church that I'm at, I had done I had done a worship grant in another church, and at least on paper it looked really successful. <laughs> yeah, and so I think that because um, I'd done it before. They were they they were really interested and they thought the idea was a really good idea. Um, but I think finding finding another church that is is one that's related to you somehow uh, is really helpful in sort of um, convincing 
you know, the elder board or, or whatever, whatever you have to, to pursue the project. Um, when they talk about this meeting in 2005, I was there, and they, they said you could do things, you know, this would be great, go home. Went home and showed his ministry director, talked to my pastor and said, here are these vertical habits, let's do cool things, let's try this. Look, they're really, we don't even have to fly, it was a special thing. And he kind of looked at us and said, huh? You know, so I knew there was no follow through. And there was just nothing happening. So we kind of had to wait. And we waited, and it's been five years. And then there were a group of people who talked about things they wanted to do, and at that point I could say, oh, I know about worship renewal grants, and now is this an area we'd like to go for, because they'll give us money. And it was more kind of waiting for a couple of people to spark where I could say, there is a worship renewal grant. And then we formed a committee and eventually asked the pastor to join, which he did. But it was, it was kind of a waiting for them to get ready. That's an excellent question. Yeah. You know, I would just say with putting a grant together, and this is from other experiences as well, it takes a lot of work. Um, and so you need to have uh, not necessarily someone who's dictating everything, but kind of the, the focal point. So if you're the point person to, to put this grant together, um, I think you just have to be prepared to do a lot of the, the work, the writing part especially. I mean, that's the thing I think a lot of people um, fear the most in some sense. Um, but um, so, so it takes a lot of initiative, I think, uh, on the part of um, the individual who's interested in that grant. And then I would just, in, I would just encourage you to encourage others to, to look at the website um, that the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship has set up. I mean, there are, it's just uh, amazing the amount of material that's ever growing, I think. I would think you might have to get some extra servers. Just to, <laughs> but really, it's an ever growing resource. And so um, I think that's kind of echoing uh, Ruth's point that um, if you show people, here is what real congregations are doing with what worship renewal is. I think people will see uh, not only that it's happening, but that it happens in such different and diverse ways that I think um, that might be persuasive as well. So I would, I would try this. All posters of all the grants since the year 2000 are on our website. I talked to somebody uh, recently who teaches at a seminary and he said I assigned my students to find three posters that were interesting to them and report on those and so there is just a wealth of information from these posters but your question is so good because uh, it has to be collaborative and if it's the, per the idea of one person the board senses that right away and it probably won't get funded because it probably won't work and so we ask that it be a collaborative process. So when we submit a proposal, we need the names of five people and their contact information who are a part of this. Right away, that says it's a team. It needs a letter of support from a pastor, from so that we know that foundation has been laid because it just won't work otherwise. Excellent questions. Thank you for staying with us. Late in the afternoon, will you join me in thanking our panelists?